Welcome to the Gilded Age and Progressive Era, a podcast about the United States and the world in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. I'm your host, Michael Patrick Cullinane. This spring, the Newport Preservation Society hosted a series of public lectures on the history of the United States in the Gilded Age and Progressive Era. I was fortunate to be one of the speakers there, and I was blown away by the setting. We spoke in the Grand Hall of the Breakers, the holiday home of the Vanderbilts. And you can imagine, if you haven't been there already, that it is an opulent building with ornate decorative features and sweeping views of the shore of the Atlantic. Besides the beautiful setting, the speakers offered an insight onto what makes the Gilded Age gilded or the Progressive Era progressive. In truth, there is nowhere better to see the history of the period than Newport. The town has preserved its Gilded Age history in a way that no other place in America has, with a dozen cultural heritage centers, all mansions that once belonged to the rich or the nouveau riche of the time. Now, you might instinctively think that these places tell a small part of the Gilded Age story, that of wealthy Americans, but in fact, they tell stories about the entire era, from the working class people whose quarters are part of these houses. The mansions are also juxtaposed by the rest of the town and its history as a port and as the home of the U.S. Naval War College, built in 1884. It's got a rich sporting history as the home of the Tennis Hall of Fame, and it hosts the America's Cup, the sailing competition. I found the place to also have an international dimension. In conversation with staff at the mansions, it's clear that European artists and craftspeople are responsible for much of the decorations. The African slave trade and the subsequent mutual aid societies developed there in Newport. And there is a trans-Pacific connection, strangely enough. Commodore Perry, who quote-unquote opened Japan in the 1850s, was born, buried, and is memorialized there. Perry's father, Oliver, also has a storied life as a Navy Commodore. So there's a lot to connect the world of the Gilded Age with Newport, Rhode Island. And no doubt we'll hear a little bit about that from my distinguished guests, Trudy Cox and Leslie Jones. Trudy is the CEO of the Newport Preservation Society and an environmental activist leading the Save the Narragansett Bay campaign in the 1980s. She also then served as Massachusetts Secretary of Environmental Affairs for nearly a decade in the 1990s. And she joined the Preservation Society in 1998 and has led since then the restoration of the town's architectural heritage. She's also increased visitors to these properties. I think today roughly a million a year are coming to the houses. And she oversees the staff and the accreditations and the business of cultural management in the town. The number of awards to Trudy's name are truly staggering, and I'd be here all day if I listed them. But to summarize, she has won awards for leadership, tourism, she's got honorary doctorates, and she's obviously led in the arts and humanities. She sits on the board of a dozen cultural organizations in New England, and besides all of this, she's funny and erudite. Joining Trudy and I is Leslie Jones, another formidable force in cultural heritage management. She's a graduate of NYU and UVA. She got her start as a curator for the White House Historical Association. She, at that time, was the director of resources and programming, which is a huge remit when you think about it. It allowed her to rethink how the public interacts with the White House, which is, of course, probably the best known of historic homes. And she also contributed to some incredible media productions like the film The White House From Within. Before coming to Newport, Leslie worked at Cheekwood, a garden and museum estate in Tennessee, which she assures me is one of the most beautiful locations that I have yet to visit. She is now Director of Museum Affairs and Chief Curator at the Preservation Society, and she's responsible for curation of a dozen properties and hundreds of thousands of objects in the Society's collection. Welcome to the show, Trudy and Leslie. Thank you. Thank you for having us. I'm delighted that you're here, and um, I have, I've already, I'm going to run over why Newport is such a wonderful place to visit. Obviously, I'm slightly biased. I was there this year, and I just thought it was a, a, a great place, um, and I want to give you an opportunity, though, to make the sales pitch. I mean, Newport sells itself, but what to you makes the town important for those of us that are interested in the Gilded Age and Progressive Era? And let's start with you, Trudy. Well, Newport is in so many ways a fantastic city, and it's a very old city. So if you're interested in architecture, you you can see colonial buildings, you can see every single style of domestic architecture, all within walking distance. So if you are a student of architecture or trying to learn, uh, this is the place to come because it's all within 
an area that you can easily amble through. It's a wonderful, wonderful place to be. It's a, a very tree-like city. It's green, it's beautiful. And then overlooking the ocean and Narragansett Bay. So the, the ocean breeze during the summer is delightful. Uh, it, it has so many assets to it, so many firsts. The first golf tournament for men, the, it, you know, the music festival, the jazz festival, the classical. It's everything that you could possibly want can be found in Newport. It's a wonderful city. Uh, we've got a tremendous Redwood Library. We've got a great historical society. And then we've got the Newport Mansion. So you can't go wrong. <laughs> it's a great city to visit. Well, and let's and 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 Trudy, you've been you've been a big part of Newport for a long time with the the Save the Bay campaign, right? I mean, so you you've seen Newport change presumably quite a bit over the years. What would you say has been some of the biggest and best changes to the town? That's such a great question, Michael. And so many things come into my mind as you ask it. And and looking back, and I just this will probably surprise you, but. Um, if you look at the history of the Preservation Society, one of the things that our founder, Mike, um, Catherine Warren, um, decided to focus on very early in the, our history was the fight against the building of an oil refinery in Jamestown. And that was so visionary on her part to see that ha had there been an oil refinery built right across the bay, it would have changed this landscape completely. This would have become a very commercialized port area. It would have not been the beautiful place that we see today. So there were so many opportunities for ruination along the way, but they didn't occur because people stood up and fought hard. Um, and I have seen Newport, uh, I came, I started coming to this area when I was a baby. Um, and I have seen Newport go through many different phases before the bridge, after the bridge, while the Navy was here, the Navy left, when the America's Cup was uh, successful, we lose the America's Cup. So Newport has seen a lot of trial and tribulation. And one of the things that many historians say was the benefit to Newport was that um, it, in a way it, it's lucky that Newporters didn't could have on many occasions throughout the decades torn down much of the historic fabric of this community. It didn't happen. And as a result, we now today can boast of having the largest collection of wooden colonial buildings anywhere in America. That's what we say. I think it's true. And then this mix of very different styles all throughout the century. So it's it's a very well-preserved city is what I'm trying to say, but it has gone through its ups and downs. Uh, you know, people often ask us, how much did we pay for the breakers? We bought the breakers at full market value in the early 1970s. It was the appraised value was $399,000. So people say, how could that have happened? Well, it happened because the Navy had just left Rhode Island. Tens of thousands of people were without jobs. It was it was pandemonium here. And so the value of everything went down. And as it turned out, so did the value of the breakers. And here we come along just by happenstance, the family says that it would like to sell the house and we get a chance to buy it. So, yeah, I've seen a lot of change. You know, I don't know how long you've come here. Michael, going back how far, but you know, when the Navy's presence was here, you could see, you know, white sailors on this, white uniform sailors on the streets and, and just a very different feeling city. And all of Thame Street was Blood Alley and, you know, it was all bars and, and hot spots. And now it's a very, very different feeling community. And um, some of the change is good and some of the change is not so good, but one thing about it is that it thrives. It continues to thrive. No, that's a really good description too. the things that you can't see, because Leslie, you're not from Newport originally, and you don't have that same vision, I guess, from, well, we're talking 40, 50 years ago. Um, what's, you know, can you answer the question as well, but like from your perspective? 
Sure. Well, um, I'm what people affectionately call a wash ashore in Newport because I'm not from here. And even though I now have a child that was born here, I know that they will never be from here either. So, um, you know, I think to build off of what Trudy said, the greatest progress that Newport has achieved is in its preservation of the past. Um, so it's in keeping things that uh, have significance both visually, culturally, socially, intrinsically, and valuing those assets and making sure that they're accessible to visitors from beyond our shores. Um, I came here five years ago. Uh, it was not my first time to Newport, but it was a very easy sell for me. I was in graduate school, actually, um, a recipient of a scholarship to the Newport Symposium, which uh, was well over a decade plus ago. And that first visit was transformative for me from my perspective of being a decorative arts historian. Not only are the collections uh, within the, these houses of the Preservation Society extraordinary and world class, but they tell extraordinary American tales and narratives that are representative of the entire country, but on such a small geographical area. And that's where <clears throat> I find Newport to be just one of the most important cities in America because it it has retained and valued uh, those objects, those places, those stories, and continued to share them with the public so that we can learn from our past to, you know, as, as cliche as it is, inform our future. It's a great answer. And I think that there is no place in America that shows off the Gilded Age quite like Newport does. It is really special. I said that in my talk, and maybe we should get to the speaker series that you held in the spring. Uh, it was called Transforming America. It was six evenings of exceptionally well-attended lectures. And uh, I want to talk about all of them individually, but wanted to get a sense from both of you why you felt the series is needed. And maybe we'll start with Leslie on uh, for this question, but why did you think the series was necessary? Well, I have to give full credit to Trudy. This was uh, her brainchild uh, and Kate Pedersen, our educations manager, made it happen. So, you know, we take education um, as part of our mission, a very serious part of our mission. And in understanding the, the public's uh, rather thin knowledge about the Gilded Age, giving them the 101 course was a vision that Trudy had to essentially offer people the, the context uh, of the of the world and of America as to why these houses exist, why they're important, why this was such a transformative time in our history. And I know that Kate worked incredibly diligently on finding the best representatives as speakers that could touch upon a variety of different subjects, culture, industry, um, immigration, um, social boundaries, social changes, whereas you know traditionally we focused a lot on architecture and art history, but this was a really important shift for us to showcase that it's more than just beauty aesthetically, it is context and um, and rigor in terms of our American development. And I think that each of those lectures really gave an important perspective that helped shape our holistic understanding of the period. And then Michael, I, um, you, you um, I'm quoting you, but I think you said more happened in the 40 years or 30 years of the Gilded Age than happened a thousand years before, is that right? I did. I, I should probably contextualize that a little bit in the sense of the Industrial Revolution and then the Agricultural Revolution that kind of went before it. But I, yeah, I mean, I do believe that, too. Right. Well, I've used that in every single speech that I give and I refer it to you. But um, you know, we do a lot of market research and uh, when you uh, about our visitors and when you see our visitors refer to the Gilded Age as the Gilted, Gilted, G-I-L-T-E-D, or the G-U-I-L-D-E-D, -E you realize that maybe we all just need a little bit of education about this period of history. And I, for one, uh, I know a lot about the era, but I don't think I'd ever had anybody pull it all together for me into one package. And I now have a speech that I can go around and give uh, you know, in 40 minutes, everything that you need to know with the word, most important word being transformation. But I think the thing that's so interesting to me, and I, it's almost what I like to do the next time around, is to talk about uh, the Gilded Age and then what is still with us today. I think you did a very good job in t telling us that, Michael, and, and as did other speakers. 
Uh, but so many of the innovations of that period are still guiding this nation forward a hundred plus years later. So imagine the vision of these incredible entrepreneurs and thinkers of the, it's just a fascinating time and it doesn't seem to get the kind of credit. You know, you go from the civil war to world war one, that's America. There's nothing in between. Well, guess what? Yeah, there was a lot, the world was changing during that period and we need to understand it better. And then another prompter, of course, is um, the TV show, HBO's The Gilded Age. It certainly, it was, we were getting a lot of questions. Leslie did a wonderful thing immediately following every show, which was to put um, online, um, you know, update people about their understanding of history from the period based on what they saw the night before. And there was a lot of reaction, a lot of very good reaction. So that kind of made me think that there is a yearning to learn more, but people don't really know how to do it. And so if they're just an average citizen and they don't know how to learn more and they don't want to read a book, but they want to do a quick and dirty way to understand better, this might be a way to, to um, advance their knowledge and their thinking. And I, I do hope that maybe Americans in particular, because it's our history, will look back on this period, the 70s, 80s, 90s, 10s, zeros, and say, wow, <laughs> that must have been wild. I still am so struck by how people must have thought when they entered the court of honor at the Chicago World's Fair, the Columbian Exposition, and seen that courtyard lit up at night. It must have been mind boggling. It must have been terrifying. It must have been exciting as anything. You know, you come from a farm in Kansas and you end up in Chicago and see these classical buildings lit up. It must have been unbelievable. So it must have been such a wild time to live. <laughs> and then as, as Leslie pointed out, I don't think that many people do realize that so many of the social movements that we still live with today whether it's fighting for civil rights, whether it's fighting for rights for women, child labor, whatever, all started because of the Gilded Age, because people were reacting to and prompted to take action. It's a, just a fascinating time. So you'll have to help us with the second series, which, which tries to tie today to, to the lessons that we learned from that period to what we can put into place today, Michael. Okay. I take your point. Yeah, no. And I think you're absolutely right about Julian Fellows's television show, the Gilded Age, which it's worth uh, giving a shout out to the Newport Preservation Society's YouTube channel, because Trudy, you interviewed Julian Fellows and also Leslie, you helped consult on some of the historical um, matters that they covered in the show too. So I just wanted to give the Preservation Society kudos for all that work as well. Uh, but let's go to a different lecture. Let's start off with design professor Matthew Bird of the Rhode Island School of Design. He discussed technology and the Gilded Age as well as, as that period being America's first information age. And I was convinced by it, certainly was. And I'm wondering, were you convinced? By his lecture? Yeah, I thought he was a, a very dynamic speaker. And uh, and it was beautifully presented visually. His he, he's just, he, you can understand that he's with the Rhode Island School of Design. Uh, he, he just has a notch above all the rest of us who put PowerPoints together. I, you know, I thought that, again, what he did such a good job on was to uh, remind us that so many of the things that we live with today were founded and invented during that pe period, whether it was the um, elevator that allowed us to, skyscrapers to be built so that you get could get people from the first floor to the 20th floor, or whether it was the typewriter, or whether it was, again, again, and again, and again, the inventions that he came forward with, uh, the electrical light bulb, and, and or making it more commercial, and the phonograph, and the cable cars, and just new forms of uh, tractors, and yeah, he he convinced me a lot, and I think he was able to pack into uh, his short lecture a lot of information 
that reminded us that if there is nothing else you learn about the Gilded Age, it's about transformation, it's about change, it's about innovation, it's about invention. That's what the Gilded Age is. So Leslie can add more because she's a better historian than I am. <laughs> no, I, I thought that Matthew brought um, a great sense of understanding about how rapidly technology was developing during that period how uh, if you were born in the 1870s and were by 20 years old in the 1890s, you were seeing things change so quickly, quicker than our generations are currently, on how the world was being developed and processed. Um, and, you know, the, uh, the ways in which things were designed for and also excluding certain uh, demographics as well. So I think that it was great context. And again, speaking to some of the other points we've talked about so far, that uh, what we have today as a society and a societal structure is so heavily influenced not only by, you know, the policy and the the events that are taking place during that time, but the object, the mecha mechanics and the technology that's being developed. Um, it is extraordinary to think that some of the same ideas and breakthroughs that took place during that period are what we are still basing our entire modern society on today. Yeah, I thought it was a remarkable talk. I also thought Will McIntosh's presentation really struck at the heart of Newport's identity as one of the Gilded Age's um, uh, playgrounds, you know, their primary summer playground. But Will also covered some places that were working class playgrounds like Coney Island in, in New York. What do you think was the big takeaway from his talk, Trudy? I, well, the takeaway for me, and again, I am not the historian that Leslie is, um, I was surprised that, and it makes, this is so what's so interesting to me about this history. We all kind of know Gilded Age history, but it never got pulled together for me. So Coney Island, vacation spot, I never thought of it that way. But of course that makes sense after hearing Will McIntosh's, McIntosh's speech, that that was a way for those who could not afford to go to far away to still escape the heat of the city and have fun and do it in an affordable way. That's how it became a vacation spot. So I think the takeaway was, uh, oh, there were so many takeaways actually from his speech. Um, just the whole way that you went on vacation to the areas, and again, it makes sense once you're told it, but I never thought about it before, that vacation spots were developed where the trains were going. That makes sense. I get it, but I never thought about it. So I, I thought he was fantastic. I wish he would have talked more about Newport as a vacation spot, but I loved learning about the other vacation spots that he taught us about. And Leslie can add more, please. Yeah, no, I, I agree. I think um, what I, in speaking and referring back to Coney Island, uh, I think one of the greatest takeaways from his talk was that uh, the Gilded Age presented one of the first periods in our history where a growing middle class could take a vacation. Um, they had the opportunity through uh, work regulations and the new work week and work hours and pay um, periods that were uh, you know, basically coming from um, the more urban uh, structured job opportunities than the agrarian society, people could actually structure their lives to enjoy leisure and recreation. Um, I, in, in contemplating, again, my background being furniture history, it's not where I've, I've focused my studies, but it certainly makes sense as you see uh, the types of objects that are being developed to allow for comfort and for, uh, you know, again, leisure. It, he brought together the ideas of all of America being able to go and enjoy serenity and peace away from, you know, the rather chaotic average life that people were living. Um, and what we've, we've come to learn about Newport too, and this has been part of our research ongoing, is that yes, Newport was a great destination for the elite and the wealthy, but there were also a lot of middle class individuals who were coming from Boston and from New York to enjoy uh, stints away from their their professions and from their their everyday lives. So, 
uh, as a city, uh, not to again promote who we are, but I think that's why we're here today, is we we sort of encompass a lot of those different um, opportunities for all Americans during that period. Uh, and we see this through the types of um, ship uh, shipping opportunities, I shouldn't say shipping, but um, the Fall River Line that brought people of all different classes from New York to to Newport for uh, a leisure activity or um, a holiday away from their average lives. So, no, I think I think Will did a great job in, in helping frame the context of what it meant to get away at that period, especially now considering that we're in the summer months and most people are taking their holidays and vacations. Uh, it resonates now more than ever. Well, I think that um, what Leslie says is so valuable because I think uh, it's only in recently that we too have in Newport have come to understand that there was a growing black population in Newport and it was a very successful population in the 1880s and 90s and that um, African-Americans were coming to Newport as a getaway place as well. And a lot of these stories are not stories that we traditionally have thought about. We, we all have gotten caught into this is uh, the box that the Gilded Age and everything must fit into. And actually, there's a whole lot more dimension and depth to this period of history. And I don't quite understand why a fuller story about this era hasn't been told yet and why it has taken us more than 100 years to tell it. But we're going to get to the bottom of it. That's the idea of the lecture series, I think, isn't it? It's to get to the bottom of all these questions. I think one of the things that's been persistent through all of it has been the railroad. I mean, I think we probably have to think about more podcasts with railroad historians because Will's talk, I was thinking about Atlantic City the whole time I was listening to it. The railroad brought people to Atlantic City. Without it, no one, no one would have gone there. Um, that's my New Jersey sort of, uh, you know, I, I holiday down the Jersey Shore. So that was, that was where we went, not Atlantic City, but down the shore. And then... I, I guess that is a nice segue into Nancy Younger's, Professor Nancy Younger's talk uh, about the working class. She's been on this show before, um, and she has for a couple of years, well, she's been a major part of the Society for Historians of the Gilded Age and Progressive Era. Um, and she spoke about the burgeoning middle class uh, when she was at Newport, and she did her talk. How do you think her talk differed from some of the others, Leslie? I would say it brought in a whole new train of thought for what our other five speakers had discussed. And it was the lives and livelihoods of people that are left out of the archive. Um, it's easy to find information about Gilded Age uh, tycoons and robber barons because their papers are kept, their papers are documented. They're able, we're able to source them as a part of larger repositories. But what Nancy brought to light were the average lifestyles and lived experiences of people that aren't necessarily represented in, um, in our collective uh, sort of documentation uh, system in the U.S. and probably from a global perspective too. I love that Nancy touched on um, what it meant to to be a worker, what it meant to uh, earn a salary, what it meant to live in a period where the Monday through Friday work week was established. Because prior there were no rules, but because of um, people's courage and their application of understanding what living in America and the American dream was supposed to be. Uh, they fought for equal pay. They fought for more established hours. They fought for the you know, the first introduction of benefits into into their um, their professional careers. So, and also for better working conditions, which again today uh, we have ourselves we have those people to thank for our weekends. <laughs> so it's it's it seems so simple, but for what Nancy touched on was that these were very huge risks for people to take. Um, they were uh, really on the front line of fighting for um, better lives and an established society that treated people as equally as as they could fathom at that time. There's still a lot of work to do, and we still have a lot of work to do. But um, I found her her perspective to be, for me, and of course, understanding my own heritage, the most relevant and the most I could connect with, knowing that these working class individuals were shaping. Um, our modern workforce and uh, essentially our society today. I think that's such an interesting observation. And when you think about the period and uh, pe people coming into this country, um, very hopeful and excited about their opportunities here, 
uh, perhaps coming from countries where things were much worse. And then they arrive and they're living in tenements and not necessarily healthy conditions and jobs that are tough. And then uh, the, the rising up, and as Leslie said, the courage it must have taken so many workers to rise up in the homestead strike or whatever, uh, knowing that, you know, if you don't win, you're really going to be in a lot of trouble. You're not going to have a job ever again. Imagine the courage of these people to say, I got to fight for what's right. And that was what the Gilded Age represents as much as the wealth of the Gilded Age and as much as the entrepreneurship and much of the innovation is this whole part of the population saying, you know what, we're going to make things better and I'm willing to put everything at risk. I, that's an incredible story. It is. It's a great story. And I mean, the other thing that I'm just thinking of now is, as I listen to you both speak about the everyday people, is that Nancy's talk also spoke about gender as well. And I'm, I'm going to take the opportunity because I'm speaking to two female leaders of the cultural heritage industry. And I, I wanted to hear from you about how that might influence your decisions and how the how the women of the Gilded Age and Progressive Era might inspire decisions being made in today's, you know, sort of cultural history management. Well, what initially comes to mind is that it was the women of this era that made our jobs possible today, um, that made the Preservation Society, the idea of it possible today. You have these groups such as the Colonial Dames and the Daughters of the American Revolution who are starting to save historic sites and properties and acknowledging the importance of place and what place means to our history. And that's exactly what drove Catherine Warren. That's exactly what drove Trudy and drives Trudy today and also what inspires me and drives me as well. Um, but the preservation movement was largely started by women and in this period too, surrounding the bicentennial celebrations in 1876. I should say the centennial, not the bicentennial. The centennial celebration. So um, I I think that, and, and as we've learned too from our own sites and from others across the country, particularly in New York um, and along the, the Gold Coast of Long Island, the building of a lot of the structures that we now care for from that period uh, were at the design and inspiration of women as well. So uh, while it might seem like we are, we're new, new to the field as a as a gender, uh, we've been here all along. We actually shaped it from the very beginning. Yeah, that's very good. Well said. And I think uh, when you reflect on, um, again, it wasn't just the workers stepping forward and saying, I want to get things correct, but women stepping forward too. Um, and, and women who put, and now I'm talking about getting women the right to vote or just more equitable rights in general. Uh, I think when you think about a society woman like Alva Vanderbilt, actually going into uh, halls of Chinese women to learn from them. And this is going to be part of an exhibition that we have opening up at the end of August uh, called Celestial City that focuses on the role that um, Chinese people played in Newport during the Gilded Age. It's an incredible story, not ever discussed before. Uh, many Chinese businesses in this city in the 1880s and 1890s, something that we really didn't know about before. But um, Chinese women had the right to vote before Americans did. And so Alva Vanderbilt spent some time kibitzing with her Chinese friends to learn how did they do it? How did you secure that right? And, and marching down the streets of New York, I, I think those were pretty... Um, gutsy moves for women during that period to take, women whose husbands probably did not share their viewpoint or perhaps didn't encourage it. Maybe they uh, were with their wives in one way or another, but I, I just think it, it was such an exciting time from that perspective, but also a very hard time. Hard-fought battles ultimately won, but it took decades upon decades upon decades to win. And uh, what was the persistence that drove women forward? What, why did they stick with the issue? Those are all great stories to learn from today. And so I think, yes, part of us being preservationists by nature, but also 
uh, fighters and willing to take the chance to get to move things forward. Great answers, and thanks, thanks for uh, thanks for giving them. The the break you mentioned the breakers a lot. Obviously, that's where this these talks were on the breakers. I think is the first time you were you were holding these uh, lecture uh, lectures in the breakers, which is great. Um, you did have a Pulitzer Prize winner, T.J. Styles, who I imagine has been to the breakers before because uh, I picked up a copy of his biography of Cornelius Vanderbilt uh, when I was at the breakers. Uh, but he returned to Newport to talk about Theodore Roosevelt and the politics of the era. How did he characterize it, Rudy? How did he how did he talk about the politics of the Gilded Age? Um, well, my recollection is that TJ Styles is one of the few people that's spoken in the breakers now multiple times. Yes. Right, <laughs> we we don't we don't often host our, our lectures at the breakers. Um, and that's largely because we have another site, Rosecliff that is so well suited for um, for our educational programs, but it would, was currently under a major revitalization uh, project. So hosting people at the Breakers was a new and welcomed treat for us, and I think also for our audience, but- uh, And for the know, speakers, can I say, the speakers are also delighted. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm very glad to hear that. Um, you know, it, it's in the Great Hall of the Breakers, it is a, acoustically driven space for music, but not for talks. So we certainly had some challenges there, but we're able to uh, to make it happen with some great um, technology partners. Um, but no, hosting, hosting all these talks in one of the most opulent interior settings of the period, I think was both poetic and incredibly symbolic. Um, and I think TJ touched upon this, uh, considering his in-depth study of people from a whole host of backgrounds during that period, politicians, um, average workers, as well as great tycoons. So his his holistic understanding of uh, the characters that made it up that period and being in a place that resulted from some of the, the greatest progress of our, our nation's history was, was certainly something I took in when I was uh, listening to him in, in the Breakers Great Hall. And he, his new, you know, he wrote the book about the Commodore, um, which was the book for which he won the Pulitzer Prize, but he also... Of uh, he's also now doing a lot of research into Teddy Roosevelt, which seems like an impossible task because it seems like everybody has written a book about Teddy Roosevelt. But I thought his um, sharing information into the politics of Roosevelt and uh, Roosevelt's efforts, it, he was a reformer and his efforts to uh, sort of swing things away from the Grover, Grover Cleveland era of getting rid of African Americans in civil service positions was, I, I thought, all very interesting. It's something that I did not really understand or know before. Uh, how how important to that era Teddy Roosevelt's actions were, and that's what a lot of his talk was focused on. So for me, it was really a new understanding, uh, and a new understanding of T Teddy Roosevelt as well. I'm sure you know it, Michael, but for me, it was all fascinating and fun. Well, I was laughing when you were saying that because you said everyone's written a book on Theodore Roosevelt. And Including I'm thinking, Michael. Even me, <laughs> even I've written a book. <laughs> well, did, did you learn, did you yourself learn anything new from T.J. Sells or do you, did, because you've studied him so carefully, it, it must have been. So I, I think what I, my big takeaway from uh, T.J.'s talk was actually about corruption. And I think that's a theme that runs throughout Roosevelt's life. The Civil Service Commission he talks about as well. I wouldn't say that I learned a lot of the details, but what, what TJ has a, a unique ability to do is to package things in a way that gives you a different perspective on the past. And I think about his books about Vanderbilt, right? Lots of people have written about Vanderbilt or, or George uh, Armstrong Custer. Tons of people have written about Custer. But you you read a book that uh, TJ has written about those two people, and I'm sure it'll be the case when the Roosevelt book comes out, and you just come away with a different perspective. And that is that is magic, I think. And you know, I don't know many people that can write like that. Yeah, and he said that that um, he was telling us at dinner that that is his biggest challenge, is finding that new and different perspective. I guess that's true for anybody who's writing a book, or any historian that's writing a book. But I think that's what he is expert at. He does force you to ca ca he casts a light on the subject in a way that is just tweaked enough to where you're walking away from it, going, "Wow, that I didn't think." that way before. So he, he's a really a great master at it. 
Well, let me let me take listeners into a little bit of the event that you hosted. So after the the talks were over, you had a lovely cocktail hour where the audience could mingle with the speakers. And uh, when you spoke to your members, what did they say was the big lesson? What did they remember most from the evenings? Leslie might, well, no, I, I've had actually a great, a lot of great feedback. I, we, we had a, a group of people who were, re, they took this six part series seriously and they came to every single one. So I like, I, I kind of like this crash course rather than just having a lecture. I think there's actually a lot of value. In fact, we gave to everyone who attended all six, we gave them a little card of thanks. Um, they could prove to their friends that they really did everything that they were supposed to do. Um, the reaction that I had from a lot of people was the the, the immersion. Uh, it, 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 each one of the lectures was just close enough to the previous one that you could remember segments from the previous one and, and build upon that. So our hope had been that by the end of six, you could walk away kind of knowing you could have a conversation with Michael Cullinane. You might not be an expert like he is, but you could get through a conversation and not sound stupid. And, and you could, that was really our hope that you would really have a good background. And my, my feedback has been that people really, really learned just what they needed and just what they wanted to learn. Maybe they'll go on and read more. Maybe they'll watch documentaries. I don't know. But they have the base, which is what we wanted. And I, I don't know. You're the historian, Michael, not not me. But I, I do think that if you if somebody doesn't pull the base together for you, you're going to kind of float around and not quite get the point for a long time. And what, to me, the lecture series did was give you the base, the foundation. From that, you can build. And the reaction that I've had is good. Now, Leslie, they, they the people upstairs get things immediately. So what were people writing in about? <laughs> I mean, first and foremost, that the entire experience was delightful, um, well worth, and probably an undervalued ticket in terms of what people receive from their experience. But, um, you know, I also liked hearing from, you know, overhearing some of the book signing conversations and then talking to some of our guests afterwards and through emails, is that this series helped people understand what world these buildings existed in. Now they can see the breakers as more than just a rich man's house. They see it as a house where people worked, a house that people built, a house where um, the what we would consider very primitive technology was able to make possible. Um, and so that to me is an exceptional way of recategorizing what the Preservation Society's properties are all about. Uh, they don't exist as islands unto themselves. They're part of a world that is no longer with us, but it, it certainly um, helps us understand and I guess uh, connect more with our past than we would otherwise just by seeing them driving down the street occasionally on any given day. Because what's also great about having the speaker series in the spring was that we had Newport residents, year round residents um, that live with these buildings every single day, being able to um, form new opinions, greater opinions, more positive outlooks on what what these structures represent. Well, that is such an interesting answer because I'm going to put this back to you now again, Leslie, because it's kind of your job to continue to reinterpret these places. So knowing what you know now, and I know you both are part of, you know, there's multiple series. There's a summer series as well. And there was lecture series that went before this spring series too. Uh, but taking away from the spring series, how do you take the knowledge that you have Take the knowledge that your your the donors and your guests have. How do you translate that into a reinterpretation of the breakers or the you know the half dozen other houses that you're looking? At? It's almost a dozen houses that you're looking at. How do you make that a reality? Well, you know, we we start slowly, um, and I think from an interpretation perspective, we look at each of these houses as a chapter in the great American architectural canon book. <laughs> um, so we we have re reinterpreted one of our, our sites most recently, Hunter House, that reopened last year. 
And it went from what was categorized as a connoisseur's tour, just focusing on the decorative arts, um, style, material, and uh, construction, to really an understanding of what the lived experience in that house was like through several generations of occupation, including enslaved individuals, which we'd never touched on before. And that was an incredibly powerful and humbling experience, um, incredibly important. And we're taking that same philosophy and applying it to our other houses in increments because uh, our knowledge base is building upon how we move through these houses in a sequential and um, chronological order. So you know, we're working on the Elms right now, um, re-understanding how we can better interpret that space from not just uh, an object perspective or what the stories objects, objects can tell rather than just why they're important. Um, and so I would say there's not one particular answer to that question because each house presents such different opportunities, different narratives. Uh, but we are we're taking that time now to to see where we can build upon um, the visitor experience through tours, but then also through our educational programs. So, uh, yeah, it's it will certainly be a great case study to see how we're able to accomplish this. But I also think that even saying accomplished, the work will never be done. So it will be cyclical and we'll continue to revisit all these stories in the way that we share them with the public through various outlets. I, I think it, it too, I, I know for, for a fact that um, in all of the speaking engagements I do, my story is a very different story today than it was three or four or five years ago. And I think I was doing a pretty good job three or four or five years ago. <laughs> but I, I the my the depth of my overall understanding and again the complexity of the era and the fact that if you only talk about the Vanderbilt family, you're really shortchanging the public. It is not a story about the Vanderbilts or the Berwins or the uh, you know the Astors. It's a story that is multidimensional. It is a story that has good parts to it and not, not so good parts to it. And you've got to tell that whole story. And I think that, you know, we we talk about this a little bit, Leslie and I, we, we've got to really do a, a whole overhaul of the tour that we give through uh, the Breakers and all of the other Gilded Age houses. We're beginning to do that at the Elms. Um, the story of old days was about the Berwins. The story of the new days is going to be the Berwins and a lot of other things. That, to me, is the way that we will, I hope, uh, get people perhaps more interested in history and, and maybe have a better understanding. We're, we're partially guilty for perhaps this misperception of the Gilded Age, the Gilded Age only being these glamorous houses on Bellevue Avenue. A bigger story than that. And so our story has to be told in a more deep way, I think. And, you know, I'd love your thoughts on this, not, not on this show, Michael, but at some point, how do, we, uh, how do we bring the story alive? You have so much to tell in a tour. You've got 45 minutes, even 45 minutes is not enough. You know, and people kind of veer off after about 20. So what do you hit them hard with so that they really can walk away with something that they internalize and really understand that's hard so that's why it takes time it's really hard and i mean we're grappling with this at the theodore roosevelt presidential library which just broke ground last month in north dakota um how do you how but also you know how do you cater for young children and much older people who have seen generations of change to generations that that have seen no change and this is all they know. I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a. How do you deal with different generations? How do you deal with people with very different stories that came from different backgrounds? And you have to address all of that. I think it's it's not an easy job to manage cultural heritage. And I, I'm so glad that both of you are doing it because, uh, you know, Trudy, you've got an extensive um, number of years experience working in in Rhode Island and in Massachusetts and. And Leslie, your work with the White House Historical uh, White House Historical Association, and with um, and in, in in the South as well, and in, in gardens and houses, you you know better than I do. In fact, I should be taking notes from you. We need to get you as consultants for for other projects. Um, but I, I wanted to give both of you an opportunity to say to the listeners what they can do to help, because this is kind of a shared burden, isn't it? 
uh, cultural and heritage management is not something that you two can do on your own. You do need the buy-in from people. How do you get that buy-in and what can people do to help support preservation societies like yours? Well, I think if they, um, I, I hope that their interest will be broad enough to, to give a little bit of time uh, to the local historical society. I know it sounds, you know, old people type stuff, but you can really have a lot of fun and, uh, I, I, you know, organizations like the Preservation Society never have enough money to do all that is needed. And I don't want to make a pitch. I'm just talking reality. There are so many um, nonprofits who just automatically get money because the cause is a good one. I think we have to work harder. I don't think people always understand that, you know, protecting history has to be fought for. Protecting buildings has to be fought for. If you don't have a base like the Preservation Society fighting, you're not going to protect your history and your buildings and your culture. So that requires support. And the $50 here and the $100 there can really make a difference. And uh, hopefully what we give back to our members is good enough fun enough. We do a wow of the day that our members, I hope, learn a little bit about history on and keep up to date on what's happening in Newport. And uh, this is a community. I, I really, I, I don't have this well formed in words, but I do think that Newport is a very important American town that is a little notch up than other American towns and cities because it has such diversity and it goes back to the founding of this nation and so you know just like in Europe there are some Regenberg there, there are places that are always going to be around I think Newport is one of those and where you can learn a lot about 250 300 years of history and that becomes then part of your job to help maintain everybody's job well said Trudy you've got to follow or uh, Leslie you've got to follow that up <laughs> um, I'll take a slightly different angle, and I always think of it from the perspective of who has what. Um, you, everyone would probably assume that historical societies and places like the Preservation Society have all the research materials that they could possibly ever dream of, but that is not the case. Um, we are constantly looking for more information about people's ancestors, about um, you know different events in history, and you'd be amazed what's probably hiding in your attic right now. So we can always use more information. Um, I know that there's this common uh, assumption that there's a generation out there that just doesn't care anymore about history. And that's my goal, since I think I fall into that generation, to change that perspective and to know that um, keeping history maintaining it and being interested in it is only for the betterment of our entire society. Um, I would also say too, if, if you're not able to financially contribute to these institutions, volunteer. Um, as Trudy said, from a budget perspective, it's they can't always do what they need to do in order to maintain properties or do the work that they need, but volunteering hours help them save money and help them also make a deeper community impact. So um, See what you've got rummaging around in your in your trunks and in your basement and in your attic. If it has anything to do with Newport, please call me. Uh, and also at the local level, um, volunteering hours as little or as much as you can really makes a significant difference in these institutions being able to do their good work. Can I just say that I am so grateful that the two of you are there fighting for history. You're fighting for the preservation of places and the reinterpretation of them, which is so important for future generations. So let me let me just thank you for that. And also thank you for joining the show and sharing your, your expertise and insight. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks for having us. Well, that's all we have time for. Thanks for listening. You can follow the Gilded Age and Progressive Era on Twitter or on my website, michaelpatrickcullinane.com. Please consider subscribing or reviewing the podcast wherever you listen because it really makes a big difference and helps direct others to the show. I hope you'll join me again for the next episode.